So tonight we're going to be talking about pancreatic cancer and some of the state-of-the-art management um, options that we have in 2021. I have nothing to disclose. So let's talk about anatomy and physiology first. So the pancreas is an organ that sits in the middle of the abdomen behind the stomach. And so food goes down the esophagus into the stomach and into the first portion of the intestine. At this junction is where the pancreas drains its pancreatic enzyme and where bile drains from the liver. And together, the bile and the pancreatic enzymes mix with our food and help us digest the nutrients that we take in. Some unique things about the pancreas are that the anatomy of the gland is separated into the head, the body, and the tail. And the tail uh, lands itself right at the uh, hilum of the spleen. So this organ sits in the, in the tail, adjacent to the tail of the pancreas. And the blood vessels that feed the spleen and drain the spleen sit immediately behind the pancreas. Additionally, the pancreas has the unique um, geography whereby if there are tumors in this area, there's blockage of not only the duct that drains the pancreas, but the duct that drains the liver and the gallbladder. And that can sometimes present itself some unique problems, which we will discuss. Looking a little bit more granular in terms of the function of the pancreas, not just its anatomy, but its physiology, is that based on its unique geography, sitting at, uh, at the junction of the small intestine uh, and the bile duct, there are little glands that basically give the pancreas two major jobs. One is to make uh, digestive enzymes, and two, to produce hormones such as insulin and glucagon that regulate blood sugar. Um, it is sometimes a clue when patients develop new onset diabetes that perhaps a pancreatic cancer is brewing. To that end, because there are two functional jobs of the pancreas, there are two separate subtypes of cancers that can develop in the pancreas. One are the neuroendocrine tumors. These begin as uh, tumors that come from cells that make hormones such as insulin or glucagon. Tonight though, we're focusing on the classic adenocarcinoma, the classic definition of pancreatic cancer as we know it or as we hear about it. And that type of cancer is thought to arrive from these exocrine cells that make the pancreatic enzymes that mix with our food and help us absorb our, our nutrients. And as I was mentioning before, when there's a tumor in this area, there is potentially a blockage of the bile that drains the liver in addition to blockage of the duct that drains the pancreas. Unfortunately, this location is also very unique in that there's a, there are two very prominent blood vessels that sit immediately behind this area of the pancreas, the vein that drains the intestines and feeds the liver, and then the artery that feeds the intestines. It is these two vessels that determine if a pancreas cancer can be removed. When a tumor is situated in this spot, in the head of the pancreas, bile can back up and patients can present with jaundice. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. This cancer, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, is the eighth most common malignancy. It's the fourth leading cause of adult cancer deaths. The most common cancers are lung, breast, uh, prostate, and then thereafter, in terms of cancer deaths, are uh, pancreatic cancer. In 2021, there's at least an expectation of 54,000 new cases and at least 43,000 deaths, although that number is likely a little bit higher. The lifetime risk of all comers is one in 65 Americans, 1.5%. The average age of onset is 72. The vast majority, 90% are older than 55 and 70% are greater than 65 years old. So a common question I get asked, well, what, what are the risk factors of this disease? Well, smoking uh, two to three times increased risk of, of uh, developing pancreatic cancer in patients that smoke. It's not quite clear 
what the cause effect is, uh, or is it a correlation, but smokers have a higher risk of developing pancreatic cancer. Patients with diabetes, they are also at higher risk of developing pancreatic cancer. Patients with chronic pancreatitis, that is a chronic inflammation of the, pan of the pancreas gland. And so the pancreas gland gets injured and tries to repair itself, gets injured, tries to repair itself. And in some way during that repair process, there's a mutation that happens in the cells and those cells try, uh, uh, lose their normal stop mechanism and just grow. And pancreatitis can be found in several different ways, hereditary pancreatitis, so inherited. In patients with uh, cystic fibrosis, there's chronic pancreatitis, autoimmune pancreatitis, patients that have alcohol-induced pancreatitis. These are all risk factors for chronic pancreatitis. And then familial syndromes, what are those? Those are genetic predispositions to developing pancreatic cancer. There are some that are very well described like BRCA1 and BRCA2, this month, November, is Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. Last month was Breast Cancer Awareness Month. But what these two months have in common in the BRCA1 and 2 genes are that normally we think of breast and ovarian cancer for those genes, but there is a 35 to 5% lifetime risk for pancreatic cancer in those patients. PALB2 is another germline mutation. P16, which is a familial atypical multiple mole uh, or melanoma um, syndrome, that increases your lifetime risk 10 to 17% for pancreatic cancer. So we screen those patients. Patients with putz jaeger syndrome, 11 to 36%. Hereditary pancreatitis, up to 40%. And then there's the hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer syndrome, where there are mutations in these DNA repair genes, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6. 3.7% lifetime risk of developing pancreatic cancer. So how do patients present? Uh, most often, if the tumor is in the head of the gland and blocks the bile duct, like I showed earlier on, patients will have bile back up into their bloodstream. And it's like putting a, 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 creating a traffic jam for bile, no route of egress. The bile builds up in the bloodstream and it parts itself in the um, skin, in the sclera, underneath the tongue. Patients will also complain of very light colored stool where the bile is no longer going through their digestive system. And, and the way one uh, route of escape for that bile is through the urine. So patients will say that their urine has been become profoundly dark. Um, patients may complain of weight loss that is unintentional, upper abdominal pain or crampy abdominal pain, and then really a new diabetes diagnosis is associated with pancreatic cancer or someone who perhaps has had diabetes for a long time and has an acute change where they are requiring much more insulin than they need to uh, um, uh, recent times. And that is an alert that perhaps a pancreatic cancer is lurking. So if you have a pancreatic mass or if you have um, uh, a lesion seen in your gland, just like any mass or any cancer in the body, we have to name it, we have to stage it, and then we have to treat it. So establishing a diagnosis, assessing if it can be removed with surgery, um, talking about some technical aspects of, of surgery, and then the management of metastatic disease, which Dr. Chung will address today, and the concept of palliation. So if you may remember or recall that I said that the uh, pancreas is unique in that it is wrapped around these two big blood vessels, the vein that delivers blood from the intestines to the liver and the artery that delivers blood from the heart to the intestines. The relationship of the tumor to these blood vessels determines if a patient is considered resectable or the tumor is removable, borderline resectable, Maybe it could be removed if it were shrunk a little bit or unresectable or locally advanced. Those terminologies are what we use as surgeons to determine if we can offer a patient surgery now or in the future or perhaps never uh, in the concept, in the context most often of metastatic uh, disease. So if a tumor is located here, it's the pancreatic head and it's clearly resectable and the uncinate still resectable, the body resectable, and the tail resectable. 
for us, we use CAT scan or MRI. And in order to get a tissue diagnosis, we do something called an endoscopic ultrasound where a gastroenterologist does an endoscopy and through the stomach wall with ultrasound guidance, pierces the stomach wall and obtains a sample of the tumor. If this is not possible, interventional radiology does it through the abdominal wall. Sometimes it's just not possible. We try different, different maneuvers and still can't get a definitive diagnosis. If a patient has a distal bile duct stricture or a narrowing of that bile duct and they become jaundiced, 80% of the time, this is, uh, correlates with a malignancy. And it can be either due to a duodenal ampullary. The ampulla is this little duct that uh, um, is adjacent to the bile duct and the duct that drains the pancreas. The bile duct itself or, or cancers that arise from the pancreas. So bile duct strictures are associated with these four different cancers that can all happen right at this, um, at this junction. And then a tumor marker that we check for pancreatic cancer is CA19-9. It is not diagnostic, but we use it as a tool to res uh, as a response to chemotherapy or um, as a marker of how extensive the disease burden may be. And so in terms of, again, assessing resectability, this tumor, this tumor, unlike the ones I showed you previously, are considered borderline resectable because they are impinging on this vein and impinging on this vein and this artery. And so we look at this on CT scans and make this determination. And patients that present in this way, we will often treat them with chemotherapy and possibly radiation before surgery if they don't have any metastatic disease. Uh, the other thing about the endoscopic ultrasound, in addition to giving us a biopsy, it gives us a more detailed assessment of blood vessel involvement, as I mentioned previously. And then ERCP, when a patient presents with a tumor causing blockage of the bile duct and jaundice, one of the first things that we need to do, in addition to getting a diagnosis, is relieving that jaundice. So our gastroenterologists go in endoscopically, go through the stomach, go into that duct, pass a wire, and then pass a stent over that wire so that bile can freely flow and patients will start actually feeling much, much better. We often say if it's early in the course, it would be beneficial to seek a surgical opinion prior to any instrumentation because if the tumor is early and the bile number or the bilirubin is quite low, surgery can be done up front and avoid extra procedures for, for patients. There are different kinds of stents that our gastroenterologists place. They're plastic stents and metal stents. The problem with the plastic stents is that they can get blocked and then the patients uh, present with cholangitis or sepsis secondary to bacteria blocking these stents and getting into the bloodstream. So oftentimes if a patient is gonna get chemotherapy before surgery, we will endorse them getting something called a metal stent. Um, these metal stents last a lot longer than the plastic stents and they're much less prone to getting uh, occluded and minimize the risk of the patient getting cholangitis. So we prefer metal stents to plastic stents in patients that are gonna need the stent for quite some time or in patients who are not candidates for surgery and are just gonna be treated with chemotherapy. Well, um, one consideration or one point of discussion has been, has been, well, so you said CT and MRI, well, do you ever use PET scans? Uh, we have found that PET scans are useful in certain circumstances when patients have very high CA19 9s, but on uh, standard imaging, we don't see any evidence of distant disease. And a study published in 2018 from uh, the UK was found that PET scans influence management 45% of the time and stop futile surgery 20% of the time. So, in patients with an elevated CA19 9, we will often use PET scans to help us look for distant disease so that we don't put somebody through surgery when they have metastatic pancreatic cancer that we couldn't otherwise detect. So as I uh, had alluded to, there are different aspects or different geography of the gland that dictates what kind of operation a patient may require. So I first wanted to talk about distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy. This is what I do for a living as a surgeon. Um, if a tumor presents itself in the tail of the gland, 
the operation that the patient needs is a distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy. And as you may recall, I said the blood vessels that feed and drain the pancreas uh, sit immediately behind the gland in order to remove the tumor and the associated lymph nodes, the spleen has to go. And so usually what we start with, if this is an open operation, is a diagnostic laparoscopy to make sure there's no metastatic lesions that we couldn't otherwise see on, PET, on CT or MRI. And we palpate, uh, make a small incision, palpate the abdomen, we mobilize the stomach out of the way. We divide the artery that feeds the spleen. We then divide the pancreas, and then we divide the, uh, the vein that sits also behind the gland. We usually leave a drain at the cut edge because the pancreas is a very soft gland, and oftentimes that cut surface can, can leak pancreas enzymes, and you don't want those freely leaking in the abdominal cavity. That happens about 20% of the time. More, more so now, in 2021, we offer at City of Hope, uh, almost for every resectable pancreas cancer, a robotic approach, which is a minimally invasive approach. Uh, this is a, a patient of mine where we're freeing up the stomach and freeing up the blood cells that feed it. This is a vein that drains the stomach. Now we're dissecting the splenic artery, which is the artery that feeds the spleen that's immediately uh, adjacent to the pancreas. We use staplers to divide it. And you can see now we're dividing, uh, mobilizing the inferior aspect of the gland up. And now we're getting a little umbilical tape around the pancreas. Now that stapler is dividing the pancreas. You can see that staple line that's reinforced. And now we're dividing the splenic vein, which is the vein that drains the spleen behind the pancreas. And now we're freeing the pancreas from the posterior aspect of the abdomen. You can see the spleen in the right upper quadrant of your screen. Uh, once the spleen is freed and the pancreas is freed of all its attachments, the operation is essentially over and we place the entirety of the specimen in a specimen bag. Uh, so that it doesn't touch any aspect of the um, abdominal wall to spread any cancer. We remove it and then we send it to pathology to make sure that the margins are negative. And I would say in America, over the past five years, more and more we're offering minimally invasive resections. And I would say the robotic approach has made that much more accessible and offers patients a much faster recovery and a um, uh, certainly a better quality of life than, than the open approach. If a tumor is in the head of the pancreas, we have to perform something called a Whipple operation, which was described by Alan O. Whipple in 1935. He refined it to one stage in 1940. I can tell you that we've come a long way since 1940. Uh, the average length of stay for our pancreas uh, uh, surgeries or Whipple's is on the order of five to seven days. Um, the average uh, uh, operative time is about six hours. Again, we start with a laparoscopy and we um, make sure there's no evidence of metastatic disease, make a midline incision, we inspect and palpate the abdomen, we free up the stomach and move it out of the way. And we look at the superior mesenteric vein at the neck of the pancreas, right in this spot, to make sure that we can tunnel underneath because right in this area in the pancreas neck is where we're gonna be dividing. And the specimen looks like the image on the left of the screen where the tumor uh, is invading the bile duct, the intestine, and the head of the pancreas. And so we end up dividing the bile duct, the gallbladder always goes, the stomach, the pancreas, and the small intestine. And then we subsequently do a reconstruction connecting three areas, the pancreas connection, the bile duct connection and the stomach connection. And again, the pancreas is a very soft gland that's prone to leaking. And so we place a drain in front and behind that connection to minimize the patient getting ill from any pancreatic leak. And those drains are removed in the hospital or they're removed in the, uh, in the uh, office. We have uh, initiated an enhanced recovery after surgery protocol to optimize patient nutrition and physical activity before surgery and after surgery to really get them to um, their baseline as soon as possible so that they can be treated with systemic therapy and minimize their risk of recurrence. So 
The problem with pancreas cancer is that only 20% or only one out of five patients present early enough to be candidates for surgery. The remaining are treated with systemic therapy. And so I will pass this podium on to Dr. Vincent Chung, who is a professor and pancreas program leader and, 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 and leads our phase one trials. So um, this is our pancreas team. These are the surgeons that treat pancreas cancer at City of Hope throughout our network spanning all the way from Antelope Valley all the way to um, Upland and Rancho Cucamonga and our uh, radiation oncologist, Karyonini and Yi Jen Chen, Vincent Ch uh, Chung, our medical oncologist, and James Lin, our advanced and, uh, uh, endoscopist. Thank you very much. Below is my email if you have any questions for any uh, follow-up, I don't address them today. Great, thank you. That was a great talk. And uh, now I'm gonna actually give you a whirlwind tour of all the different types of treatment. Um, let me share my screen here. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are, that looks good. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, thank you so much. And, and you know, hopefully uh, I can actually cover um, this area. This is actually a really exciting area in terms of managing pancreatic cancer because we made a lot of progress over the years and we're seeing you know, patients that are surviving uh, much longer. Um, my longest surviving patient right now is going on 10 years with stage four disease. So um, this is a really exciting time for um, pancreatic cancer research. So as part of an overview, I wanna kind of talk a little bit about the clinical presentation of pancreatic cancer. So this is gonna be a little bit of a rehash of uh, some of the th things that uh, Dr. Melstrom was actually you know, educating you about. Um, I think this is actually good because it helps to reinforce some of the points that she was making. And then I wanna kind of go through and talk a little bit about the treatment. And I'll go through talking about adjuvant treatment, um, which is actually chemotherapy after surgery, new adjuvant treatment, which is chemotherapy before surgery, uh, followed by the treatment in the advanced setting, which is metastatic disease where cancer is spread. And also I wanna to touch about the new concept of maintenance therapy, which is actually uh, coming into play now that we have better therapies for this disease. And finally, I wanna finish up talking about some of the exciting research that's ongoing in the future. So as we all know, the scope of the problem, uh, this has been a really huge problem and um, in 2021, it's really estimated that actually about 60,000 new cases uh, will be diagnosed and about 48,000 deaths. And we've actually lost a few notable people in the last couple of years, um, Alex Trebek, Ruth Ginsburg, and the third person is um, 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 Arnie uh, Sorensen, who's actually the CEO for Marriott Hotels. As you can see, I've stayed in a lot of Marriott Hotels and all the meetings I've actually been to. Um, but this is a disease that's really affecting many people. And um, in terms of, uh, you know, if we look at the course of this disease, um, unless we actually find better therapies, um, in 2030, uh, pancreatic cancer is going to be the, actually the second leading cause of cancer death right behind lung cancer. So talking a little bit about the clinical presentation, one of the things that I think is important to emphasize is that the reason that pancreatic cancer is such a tough disease is because it gets diagnosed in the later stages. Um, the earlier stages are really, really tough to diagnose because unfortunately, most people with pancreatic cancer are asymptomatic. Um, if the disease is actually presenting you know, in the pancreatic head, then you might be able to have um, uh, obstruction of the biliary, biliary system that causes jaundice. And that's where your eyes turn yellow and your skin turns yellow. And in those early stages, it may be able to be diagnosed um, you know, when it's surgically resectable. However, when the tumor is actually occurring more in the body and tail, uh, this unfortunately uh, may present with very nonspecific symptoms. I've had patients have had uh, like back pain or abdominal discomfort. You know, many of the primary care physicians will diagnose them with you know, dyspepsia where they have acid reflux. They'll be treated with proton pump inhibitors or acid reducers. And this may persist for a long period of time. And it's not until they start presenting with weight loss, as well as you know, increasing fatigue or loss of appetite, um, do um, they get further studies like a CT scan. And then unfortunately, at that point, they're usually diagnosed with more advanced pancreatic cancer, where surgical resection is not possible. 
So um, Dr. Melstrom is talking a little bit about making the diagnosis. And I think it's important to note that, you know, many times when people present to the emergency room with very nonspecific complaints, um, they'll start out with doing an ultrasound. And that has a lot of limitations because you may not be able to see uh, the pancreas very well if, unless they're really looking for it. Um, if they're actually looking for gallstones, then that's going to totally miss, you know, diagnosing a, a pancreatic cancer. Um, so typically when people are going to the emergency room, you know, it's really important to give a very good history so that they can order the right test to make the right diagnosis. Um, a pancreas protocol CT is really one of the best tests for really evaluating the pancreas and also evaluating the vascular structures in that area. Because if you have a tumor that's actually localized within the pancreas, you want to know whether or not this is actually surgically resectable. So doing a pancreas protocol CT, which is doing thin cuts through the pancreas with IV contrast to be able to evaluate the tumor in relation to the blood vessels is very important. Um, MRI is also a very good uh, study to evaluate the pancreas. And it's also very good at picking up small lesions uh, within the liver. Uh, so uh, this is actually a great test for being able to pick up um, early signs of metastatic disease. And uh, Dr. Melstrom actually talked about the PET CT scan, which I think is really crucial for potentially uh, diagnosing uh, metastatic disease and um, uh, you know, uh, preventing a person from going to surgical resection. So the CD19-9 is the most common blood test that we utilize uh, looking at um, pancreatic cancer. And it is unfortunately um, not just elevated with pancreatic cancer. She can make a diagnose, diagnosis with the CN19-9. This may be elevated with colorectal cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, and ovarian cancer. And there are actually some patients that don't even have a CN19-9, despite the fact that they have stage four pancreatic cancer. So this is really utilized to evaluate how a patient is responding to therapy. So if you have a, initially a high CN19-9, and you get chemotherapy, you want to see that CN19-9 drop with treatment. Another important thing to note is that there are benign conditions that can cause the CN19-9 to be elevated. So in those instances where patients are jaundiced, where their um, biliary system is obstructed and they're yellow, that will cause a very, very high CN19-9. Also pneumonia, um, effusions around the lung, uh, kidney failure, as well as lupus, uh, can cause a high CN19-9. Um, when you have a very, very high number, as Dr. Melstrom was mentioning, that typically indicates that there's probably more advanced disease. So if you have a CT scan that only shows a spot in the pancreas, and there's no other sites that are seen on the CT scan, um, a high CN19-9 may be an indicator that there could be other sites of disease that's being missed, and that's why a PET scan I think is really important under those circumstances. So unfortunately, uh, most of the cases are diagnosed in the late stages. As you can see on the left-hand side, um, over 50% of the cases are metastatic. Only about 20% are truly resectable. So what we really need to do is really need to actually um, be able to diagnose pancreatic cancer in the earlier stages so we can get more of the patients in the resectable category because uh, that's going to really have a significant impact in terms of survival. So let's talk a little bit about the treatment. So we're going to start off with adjuvant treatment, so chemotherapy after surgery. And there are three main trials that actually looked at different chemotherapy regimens. Now, what I wanted to point out to you is on the right-hand side. So the results of um, which showed that gemcitabine, gemcitabine with kipcitabine, and fulfirinox chemotherapy improved survival after surgical resection. So one of the things that we know about pancreatic cancer is that even after surgical resection, a majority of the patients, up to three quarters of patients, have recurrence of their disease. So that means that there are microscopic cells in the circulation, and we wanna be able to try to eradicate those microscopic cells before they have a chance to find a home and start to grow. Now, the results on the right-hand side with the different chemotherapy regimens going from top to bottom the survival actually improves with more chemotherapy. So gemcitabine being one drug versus gemcitabine with kipcitabine, which is two drugs, and fulfirinox, which is four drugs. Fulfirinox has by far the best survival. 
However, one of the consequences of more chemotherapy is it does lead to more side effects. So as you're getting more chemotherapy with a regimen like Fulferinox, there may be more potential fatigue, nausea, vomiting, neuropathy, um, you know, uh, uh, just side effects uh, from the chemotherapy regimen. So that's one of the things that we have to take into consideration for every patient after surgical resection is that we wanna make sure that, you know, the patient is really strong and healthy and will be able to tolerate a, a regimen of, you know, chemotherapy. Uh, because if they're um, weak after the surgery, then unfortunately they won't be able to tolerate an aggressive regimen like Fulfirinox. So these are all things that we take into consideration when trying to make a decision about which chemotherapy regimen to give after surgical resection. So some take-home points, uh, modified Fulfirinox chemotherapy, which again is the aggressive regimen for different drugs. Uh, this is the standard treatment for a patient that is really strong and healthy after a surgical resection. And we've modified it where we've actually taken out the bolus 5-FU, which is part of the chemotherapy, and reduced the dose of one of the drugs called arenotecan, which has made the toxicity profile much more manageable and patients are able to do much better in terms of tolerating it after surgical resection. Um, but as I mentioned before, there are side effects that can occur like diarrhea, neuropathy, which is numbness and tingling the hands and feet, uh, fatigue. And these are you know, side effects that can make it very challenging for patients to tolerate it after surgical resection. Um, so for those patients that do have a lot of difficulty um, after surgery, um, where they may be weaker, uh, gemcitabine plus kepcitabine, which is a two-drug regimen, or gemcitabine alone uh, can be used um, for adjuvant therapy after surgical resection. So one of the things that you're probably going to hear um, a lot more about is what's called neoadjuvant treatment. And Dr. Melstrom was mentioning this before, that there are patients where the cancer is involving blood vessels. And when it's actually involving um, some of the major blood vessels, uh, Dr. Melstrom is not able to go in and, and take it out. So what we want to try to do is we want to try to be able to shrink that tumor down so that we can actually go in and do surgical resection. So that's what neoadjuvant therapy is. It's treatment before surgical resection. And why do we want to give a treatment before surgical resection? Well, as we know, and I mentioned before, pancreas cancer is really aggressive with over three quarters of patients having recurrent disease after surgical resection. It is very difficult to tolerate chemotherapy after a major operation. And this provides treatment for micrometastatic disease. So the cancer cells that are in the circulation that we don't see on a CT scan. Uh, before surgery, the tumor has its blood vessels intact. So it gets better perfusion. So the chemotherapy, which is going in by an IV line into your bloodstream, um, it's gonna actually get to the tumor better. And it also avoids surgery in patients that have rapidly progressive disease because there are a small percentage of patients that have really, really rapidly progressive disease that you know, after surgical resection, uh, they'll present with uh, metastasis within the liver, lungs, or other places. And there are clinical trials that actually looked at this where they gave all the chemotherapy and even included radiation therapy prior to the surgical resection. And uh, this is a little bit busy slide, but um, basically patients were getting Fulfirinox chemotherapy and they got four months worth of chemotherapy. They then went on to radiation therapy. And for those patients that actually uh, went on to surgical resection, they showed that um, the survival was actually superior where patients um, were able to live many, many uh, more years uh, without signs of recurrent disease. So the median time it took for uh, signs to have uh, C on CT imaging that there was actually signs of cancer progression was about four years. And the overall survival is not even reached in this particular study. And there was actually a large European study which actually evaluated surgery alone versus different types of neoadjuvant therapy. And on the right-hand side, all I want you to really focus on is that top line. So that top line, you can see that the survival was much more superior for the patients that received neoadjuvant therapy versus surgery alone. And that's what we wanna do is we wanna move that curve upwards where we're actually really um, curing patients um, after surgical resection. So some of the key points about neoadjuvant therapy, 
um, pancreatic cancer is typically considered a systemic disease, which means that there are microscopic cells within the circulation. That's why there's such high recurrence rates after surgical resection. Um, if you are really strong after surgical resection, then the treatment of choice is full furinox chemotherapy. And this really helps to really downstage tumors and increase the resection rate, uh, which will help to decrease recurrence. So I do think that for the borderline resectable disease, we are really moving toward total neoadjuvant therapy, which means getting all the chemotherapy and also potentially radiation therapy prior to surgical resection. So what about the group of patients, which is over 50% of the patients that present with advanced disease? So this is tumor that either has spread to other parts of the body or is completely surrounding the blood vessels, in which case surgical resection is not possible. Systemic therapy is the treatment of choice. And I wanted to kind of highlight some of the key uh, clinical trials uh, that showed benefit with the chemotherapy. One of the um, earlier clinical trials actually looked at gemcitabine chemotherapy. And this is actually a very, very well-tolerated regimen. And this clinical trial had a very interesting endpoint because rather than looking at overall survival, the primary endpoint for this trial was clinical benefit. They wanted to actually show that giving chemotherapy for a patient that had advanced disease, and remember, I, I talked about patients with advanced disease will have you know, fatigue, abdominal pain, weight loss. Uh, these are all symptoms of advanced disease. So when they gave gemcitabine chemotherapy, there was actually a 24% clinical benefit, meaning that they had decrease in pain, they had decreased consumption of pain medications, they had imp improvement of their performance status, they had improvement of their weight. So they had improvement of overall their quality of life. And it was actually approved based upon this primary endpoint of clinical benefit. And it's actually one of the few studies that's been approved um, um, based upon a clinical benefit rather than an overall survival. But what we wanna also think about is that, you know, we wanna think more about really improving survival in terms of length of time and not necessarily just quality of life. And this is where two key trials come into play. The left side is the PRODIGE trial that looked at fulfirinox chemotherapy, which is the four drug regimen. The right side is the IMPACT trial, which actually looked at gemcitabine and NAPAC-taxol chemotherapy. And these are two large trials that were done internationally, which show that uh, both fulfirinox chemotherapy as well as gemcitabine and NAPAC-taxol were both superior to gemcitabine chemotherapy in terms of improving overall survival. So these are the two regimens that we typically utilize for most of our patients with pancreatic cancer if they have a good performance status and would be able to tolerate a multi-drug regimen. So how do we decide about which chemotherapy to use um, in the setting of you know, stage four disease where patients have cancer that's spreading to other um, organs, or other parts of the body? Well, Modified fulfirinox chemotherapy does have a slightly higher response rate of 31%, which means that in about a third of the patients, you'll get a greater than 30% reduction in the size of the tumor. Gemcitabine, napacotaxel, about 23%, where again, a greater than 30% reduction in tumor. A majority of the patients, about 60%, will have stable disease. So both regimens are active in terms of slowing down the growth of the cancer but modified fulfirinox has a little bit higher response in terms of shrinking down the tumor. Now, I don't think it's as important in the stage four setting about what the response rate is, because basically what we're trying to do in the stage four setting is we're trying to control the cancer for as long as we can. So we need to make sure that patients are able to tolerate the regimen. Because again, for instance, my patients is actually going on for um, you know, longer than 10 years, he had an excellent tolerance to the chemotherapy with very little side effects, was able to stay on treatment. Because if you're not able to stay on treatment, then that means that you're gonna either have to reduce the dose or you're gonna have to hold the chemotherapy, which allows the cancer cells to then grow. So we wanna take into consideration the side effect profile whenever we're trying to decide uh, which regimen to utilize, because we wanna make sure that we're able to go from one treatment to the next. So in the stage four setting, whether or not you start with fulfirinox or whether or not you start with gemcitabine, NAPAC, or taxol, I think it really depends upon the side effect profile and discussing that with um, you know, each individual patient 
um, so that we can try to preserve quality of life as much as possible. Now, for the people that have a you know poor performance status where they're really weak, maybe spending more time in bed, um, not really eating very well, uh, gemcitabine chemotherapy, I think, remains the standard. And that is, again, based upon the clinical trial I showed you before that showed a clinical benefit where patients that got gemcitabine had improvement of their pain, improvement of their weight, improvement of their overall quality of life. So this is a summary of the different types of uh, treatments for the different stages in the adjuvant setting, uh, locally advanced metastatic. And I didn't really touch about second line treatment and third line treatment, but I think that's where we're, we're going is that I'm seeing patients right now that are getting five lines of treatment, which I think is really exciting because if we're able to get our patients to tolerate you know, different lines of therapy, then we're able to control that cancer for a much longer period of time. And one of the things that I think is really exciting is if you look on the right-hand side at the very bottom in second-line treatment, pembrolizumab, which is an immunotherapy, is actually utilized in pancreatic cancer patients that have what's called microsatellite instability. So that's a DNA damage repair um, pathway that if you have a defect in that DNA damage repair pathway, these patients respond to checkpoint inhibitors, which is the immunotherapy. So getting the immune system to go in and attack the cancer. And that's where my area of research is. And I think it's a really exciting field. So moving on to maintenance therapy for pancreatic cancer. And this is again, I think really exciting because you know when I first started out way back in 2002, we had gemcitabine chemotherapy and 5-FU. And we weren't really talking about second line or third line or fourth line therapy. And this is where maintenance really kind of comes into play because what we're talking about is we're talking about giving chemotherapy to control the cancer and to preserve quality of life. So when you're on chemotherapy, we want to remember that there's going to be potential side effects that can be debilitating. For instance, oxaliplatin in the full Ferenox regimen, it causes neuropathy. And that neuropathy is a cumulative and irreversible side effect meaning the more doses of oxaliplatin you get, the more the numbness and tingling you have in the hands and feet. And that's gonna progressively continually worsen, which can actually impact your ability to tolerate treatment. Because if you can't feel your hands or feet, so you can't walk, you can't drive, you can't you know, hold a fork or, or a cup because you'll drop things because you can't feel, you know, that's really debilitating. So we have to take into consideration the side effects of the therapy so we want to try to minimize these side effects. And that's where maintenance therapy comes into play because fulfirinox chemotherapy, like I said, is commonly utilized in the first line setting for patients with you know, advanced pancreatic cancer. But we want to think about dropping the oxaliplatin in chemotherapy when we're getting to be around three to four months into treatment because that neuropathy may be actually getting worse and we want to stop the oxaliplatin before it causes really debilitating neuropathy. And that's where you continue on with maintenance, full theory chemotherapy. And I've had patients that have actually been on full theory chemotherapy for several years. So this kind of gives you an idea in terms of some of the milestones. It was very slow in terms of development of uh, some of the drugs for pancreatic cancer, but we are currently accelerating. And what we're talking about with patients with stage four disease is we're talking about trying to sequence their therapy. So going from one treatment regimen to the next treatment regimen to keep on controlling the cancer for a longer period of time. So Dr. Melstrom mentioned the genetics of susceptibility of pancreatic cancer. And again, this is um, something I think is really important to emphasize because we want to remember that pancreatic cancer can be hereditary. So all patients with pancreatic cancer should undergo germline testing, which is basically testing your DNA to evaluate you for any um, uh, genetic alterations that can be hereditary. And it's important not only for you know, your treatment, um, but also it's important for your family as well, because uh, if your family actually does test positive for any of these um, uh, genetic syndromes, then they'll need to be screened for other types of cancers, which can help to um, pick up and prevent cancers from developing in the future. So we want to make sure that you know all of the patients with pancreatic cancer undergo germline testing for uh, these genetic syndromes. 
And in 2019, uh, this actually led to an approval uh, for a drug called Olaparib, which is a what's called a PARP inhibitor. And it's actually specifically for patients that have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation. And this is a pretty rare mutation. This is actually only occurring about 4 to 7% of all patients with pancreatic cancer. And what PARP inhibitors do is they prevent the repair of these single-strand breaks. And that leads to generation of double-strand breaks, these replicating cells. And because these BRCA-mutated pancreatic cancer patients have defects in this DNA damage repair pathway, by causing further breaks in the DNA, this leads to cell death. And Olaparib, which is a pill, it's actually taken twice per day. And this clinical trial showed that it was, ab it was able to um, double the progression-free survival uh, compared to patients that were getting placebo. So this was uh, approved in 2019. So again, I need to uh, emphasize that all patients with pancreatic cancer need to get germline testing because you want to look for uh, genetic syndromes. And also patients that have advanced unresectable pancreatic cancer or metastatic disease, they need to have uh, somatic mutation testing, which is testing the tumor to look for the mutations that may be potentially driving the growth. Uh, because as I mentioned before, this may open the door for immunotherapy or as well as other targeted therapies, but these mutations are quite rare. Uh, many of these mutations are only occurring in one to 2% of all pancreatic cancer cases. So meaning one in 100 or one in 50 patients may have one of these mutations. So you are looking for needles in the haystack, but when you do find them, it does really open the door for these targeted type treatments or immunotherapies that have a significant impact in terms of improving survival. So no talk would be complete without talking about immunotherapy. And immunotherapy has had its challenges in pancreatic cancer. Um, I've been doing a lot of research with um, immunotherapy and pancreatic cancer. And uh, we've had a, a lot of challenges in terms of um, you know, finding the right patients that do respond to immunotherapy. Um, as you can see, there's been a lot of approvals for immunotherapy in many different solid tumors, but pancreatic cancer is missing from the list. Um, in 2017, though, as I mentioned before, pembrolizumab, which is a checkpoint inhibitor, was approved for MSI high solid tumors. So any tumor that is MSI high, which can be different tumor types, including pancreatic cancer, um, pembrolizumab is approved. Now, MSI high pancreatic cancer is only 1% to 2% of all pancreatic cancers. Um, so it is, a, a, again, a rare mutation that um, uh, is... Uh, you know, only a few patients will have it, uh, but those that do have it have a good response to immunotherapy. So what about novel clinical trials? And this is actually one of the clinical trials I'm leading across the country with Michael Bushvian at Johns Hopkins University. Um, this is actually a clinical trials done within the SWOG, which is a um, cooperative group. Um, so this is uh, done, you know, in, in academic hospitals, as well as community centers across the country. And this is evaluating patients that have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation that are being treated with standard uh, chemotherapy. So this is actually following the Polo trial that originally presented, where patients received four months of chemotherapy with good response. And they went on to receive Olaparib, which is the PARP inhibitor, and that was shown to improve progression-free survival. Well. My clinical trial here is actually um, looking at Olaparib plus the immunotherapy pembrolizumab. And uh, this is really based upon some of the preclinical work we did in the lab. So to give an example of how long this takes, um, this was actually a process that was started back in 2017, where um, basically coming up with the idea of thinking about DNA damage and how that actually affects um, the, uh, the cell and how does the immune system actually recognize a cell and distinguish it from a normal cell so it can try to preferentially go and attack the cancer? Well, in patients that have BRCA mutations, because there is so much genomic instability, these cells look a lot more different from a normal pancreatic cell, even a pancreatic cancer cell. So these patients will potentially have a better response to immunotherapy just because of all the DNA damage that's occurring in these BRCA mutated tumors. So 
in order to actually um, you know, uh, start uh, uh, this clinical trial up, we had to initially do mouse studies. So this is a genetically engineered mouse model with a BRCA2 mutation. And this was actually um, developed by uh, Xiaochen Yu um, in the Beckman Research Center. Uh, we actually tested uh, PARP inhibitors in combination with PD-1 in the mouse model. And we showed that the combination uh, did improve survival in the mice. And that was what was actually leading to the clinical trial, which actually opened in 2020. So it took about three years to uh, go through the preclinical studies, um, develop the clinical trial, um, present the clinical trial um, to all, all the different members of the cooperative group, as well as the um, uh, National Cancer Institute, uh, the Cancer Therapy Evaluation Program, um, getting it approved through the GI Steering Committee, and finally opening up the clinical trial for patients to enroll in. So it takes many years for a uh, compound to be developed. And eventually, once the clinical trials get completed, if it does show that the clinical trial is um, effective and patients are actually living longer, then that's when um, it'll get a FDA approval. And you could see that this could be a, you know, probably a, up to a 10 year process uh, to go through um, and get a drug um, approved. So kind of switching gears a little bit, um, one of the things I just wanted to emphasize is that we're now thinking about pancreatic cancer as more than one disease. Um, in the past, everything was kind of grouped together, but as we're doing more sequencing of the tumor, we're actually seeing that pancreatic cancer is actually uh, grouped into different categories. And there's actually different responses uh, to these different categories. Now, currently we're not able to um, uh, you know, direct treatment based upon these subtypes. But I think in the future, uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to be able to actually hopefully be able to select patients that will respond to one therapy better than another therapy. Precision medicine has been a very hot topic in, uh, um, you know, oncology. And uh, in 2013, uh, the NCI started a, a tumor call, uh, program called MATCH where they really wanted to try to sequence tumors, uh, look for mutations within tumors, and try to uh, tailor the therapy based upon the mutational profile. Uh, we did a lot of work with uh, PanCan on the Know Your Tumor program, which is still ongoing right now, where the patients are getting uh, their tumors profiled. Uh, they're looking for mutations within the tumor, and they're actually directing patients to uh, specific uh, targeted clinical trials. And we actually published this back in um, 2020, uh, looking at uh, 1,856 patients that underwent the Know Your Tumor program between June of 2014 and March of 2019. And you can see on the right-hand side, the top line, uh, these are patients that were actually being matched to therapy based upon the molecular profile. And what you can see there is, again, that curve is at above all the other lines, which is indicating that there's a, a better survival um, if you are able to match therapy. So I think in the future, we are going to be really um, looking at trying to match our patients to uh, therapies based upon their molecular profile. So to finish up, pancreatic cancer research has been really slow and rocky process. But as you can see on the right-hand side of the line on the upper part of the slide, uh, we're really getting into um, you know, better therapies as well as more targeted therapies. And we're, we're starting to see more drugs being approved for pancreatic cancer. Um, in the future, I think that pancreatic cancer will be divided into molecular subtypes. So we can start thinking about potentially tailoring therapy based upon these different subtypes. And targeted therapy, um, as I showed you before, um, has been shown to improve overall survival. So Germline testing as well as somatic mutation testing of the tumor, I think is critical for our patients with pancreatic cancer because it's gonna help direct our therapy and it's gonna help to improve survival. So I wanna thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Chung and Dr. Melstrom. This has just been so wonderful and I love kind of the encouraging note that you left it on. All this research is just fascinating and so hopeful. Um, I did get one question in the chat um, that I would like to ask, and then I'd like to invite people to unmute themselves. Um, sorry, let me dig back through the chat here. 
Um, this was kind of when you were speaking to the fact that a lot of pancreatic cancer diagnoses are often stage four or metastatic diagnoses. So somebody was just wondering about early detection research um, and any just thoughts and feedback around that. Yeah, no, great question. I mean, early detection is a really, really hot field right now.